I always tell people that I used to live my life pre the crash, followed by what I refer to as the 2P philosophy. You needed to have passion and purpose, but it wasn't until I was sitting in the raft of the middle of the Hudson River that I realized I was missing the third and the most important P, and that's perspective. Welcome to Flip Your Script, the podcast about life's critical turning points and how people find the inspiration and motivation to move forward and rewrite their unique stories. Flip Your Script is produced by Media Minefield, a public relations firm passionate about the power of sharing stories. Specializing in earned and social media, Media Minefield helps clients take control of their unique story and message. The show is hosted by Christy Peel, founder and CEO of Media Minefield, who flipped her script from an Emmy-winning journalist to a successful entrepreneur and speaker. Marianne Bruce has been called the diva of disaster. She survived a tsunami, a hurricane, an avalanche, the World Trade Center bombing, an earthquake. She was on the plane, diverted, one of the planes, diverted during 9-11, and she was sitting in seat 5D when Captain Sullenberger, better known as Sully, piloted the plane involved in what is now known as the Miracle on the Hudson. And it wasn't until that last disaster that Marianne, an experienced corporate director and former Fortune 100 division president and CEO, flipped her script. Marianne, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Christy. I'm delighted to be here. You know, our paths crossed, and I want to talk about how they did and how I met you in a little bit. But first, the part of your story that has gotten some press and people talk about is that you've been involved in these seven disasters. What's it like to be called the diva of disaster? I kind of laugh at it. I I think it's funny. Uh, My experiences have been unique, but the most important thing is that I've survived all of them. And so it's given me an opportunity to, as you say, flip the script, think of what's important and re- prioritize my life based on these different experiences that I've had. And if I've learned anything from all of them, it's that I don't want to let fear interfere with living. It's a great point. It's a great point. Do you think you would be the woman you are today had you not survived all that you've survived? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I was your typical corporate executive climbing the corporate ladder, always trying to get to the next level competing, defining success lots of different ways, but just really hard charging executive and didn't really take enough time to step back and learn about what was important. I always tell people that I used to live my life pre the crash, um, followed by what I refer to as the 2P philosophy. Um, You needed to have passion and purpose. So you needed to understand what you were doing and why you liked doing it. And I thought that was all that was important to succeed. But it wasn't until I was sitting in the raft of the middle of the Hudson River that I realized I was missing the third and the most important P, and that's perspective. And so that's what changed. I now have a much better perspective. I reprioritized what was important in my life and made sure that I'm living in the moment, enjoying the moment, spending time with family and friends and doing what I think is most important. And that's giving back and focusing on having a life of meaning. And that can only happen when you live it and share it with others. It's beautifully said and such an important point. I think what is so interesting, and I'm sure other people have said this to you, is that it took the last one for you to get there. I mean, your list is like any of these things could have kind of changed someone's perspective. What was it about the Miracle on the Hudson and sitting in seat 5D that made you think so differently when you left that World Trade Center bombing with ash on your face? I mean, and you went down the stairs in darkness. It wasn't like you drove by and saw it. You were in it. And yet that last one changed you. Was it age? Was it perspective? I mean, what was it about that one? I think it was the culmination of all of them. And at some point I took a step back and said, all right, one of my favorite sayings is I plan and God laughs. You know, how many of these do I have to experience before I get the message? And so that one, when I was literally sitting in that raft and watching everything around me and helicopters coming and then the ferries came in and it almost looked like they were going to run us over that I really felt like, oh my God, this 
could potentially could have been it. And the others, they were interesting, but I never was really thinking that I was going to lose my life per se. Whereas this one, I mean, as my husband likes to say, the definition of a plane crash is people die. (laughs) So, you know, this was highly unusual that all 155 people survived. And so I just felt like, you know, God was telling me it was time to take stock of my life. And so I think it was the combination of all of them together and that last one that made me realize I had to change. I had to do something different. And it was when you were sitting in the raft. It wasn't weeks later, days later, as the plane is coming down. It literally was while you're on the water and you must be surrounded by people who look completely shocked that this has gone on. And at that moment, you decide, okay, something has to change. Well, I decided at that moment that I needed to definitely prioritize differently. But I really think it hit home about six weeks after the miracle on the Hudson, because there was another plane crash and it was a small plane crash. I believe it was in Buffalo or Rochester. I don't recall where, but that situation happened. It was a a puddle jumper type plane and everybody on the plane perished. And it was about six weeks after our plane crash. And I remember waking up the next morning after reading it, going to bed and sitting and chatting with my husband And he said, oh, you don't, you know, is everything okay? You don't look good. And I said, yeah, I didn't really sleep well last night. And he said, well, why? And I said, well, didn't you read about that plane crash? Said, and everybody died. And that's when he had said to me, which is what I alluded to before. He said, well, that's the normal definition of a plane crash. And so that is what made me realize that I shouldn't really be here. You know, the the likelihood of what we experienced happening prior to us experience, it hadn't happened before. I mean, there were no successful emergency water landings out there until this one. One of the things Captain Sully said that I really focused on was, you know, it's only impossible until it's possible. So like when he was getting questioned about why he chose to land there, because everybody said, well, you can't make a successful water landing, it's impossible. But in his mind, it was only impossible until it was possible. And after witnessing that small plane crash where everybody had perished, that was when I was like, okay, this is really another indication that while I don't regret anything I did in my life prior to the plane crash, I felt like I left a lot on the table. You know, I just didn't spend as much time with my kids and my husband and my extended family members as maybe I would have liked. You know, I looked back and I thought, oh, well, I got to that event or I got to that event. But sometimes when I was there, I wasn't necessarily there. You know, you were multitasking, you were doing all these other things that you just weren't in the moment. And that's not living life. So you made some short-term and long-term changes to your perspective, to your life. So short-term, within weeks of that situation on that airplane, Did you step back from your career? Did you change your job? Did you quit? What did you do immediately? So immediately after the plane crash, I called my current employer and told them I had been on the plane. And they were obviously shocked because I told them within 24 hours. And they just assumed I wouldn't come back. But that wasn't my personality. But I had decided that I wasn't going to work long term. And so I said to the CEO that I was going to take a week off and then I'd get back in touch and we could have a conversation of, you know, kind of what I wanted to do next. And so I took that time to evaluate what changes I wanted to make. And from a career perspective, since I had already achieved being the C-suite executives and I had done a lot in my career, I knew that I wanted to still give back. I knew that I wanted to be involved, but I didn't want to be involved full time. And so I had served on some boards while I was um, working as an executive, mostly nonprofits, but I also worked with the mutual fund board closely of the firm that I was president of. And I had decided that board work would be a great second act. And so, and part of why I thought it would be a great second act, as I said, is you could still work from a strategic level, you could give back, you could help a company, you know, grow, which was some of the things that I got excited about. You can sometimes get involved with um, succession planning and culture and other things that I enjoy getting involved with. 
you could be a role model for others. And so I decided that I would switch and focus time on board work, both for the nonprofit space as well as the for-profit space. And so when I spoke with the, the CEO and the chairman of the company that I was working with at the time, I had said that I would stay with them until I found a board opportunity. And that during that time, while I was looking, I would find them a replacement, you know, because I didn't want to leave them in a lurch. It wasn't my style to just say, okay, I've been in this crane crash, I'm quitting work, I'm never coming back. That's not fair to them, to the organization. And so that was kind of my game plan. Your family also made some shifts. You ended up spending more time with your husband and children. How has that impacted your family now looking back on it? Well, my husband had always told me that he wanted me to spend more time with him. He had um, retired when we moved from New York to North Carolina. And so he was a stay at home dad when the kids were younger. So we moved when my son was eight and my daughter was six. And because I had taken this large job and I knew I was gonna be working 24 by seven, he had sold his small business and then he agreed to stay home with the kids because we really thought it was important that somebody stay home. But I also created an environment that would let him be his best self because I knew he didn't want to do the cooking and the cleaning and all that stuff. And so I had had full-time nanny that lived with us. And so he spent time on the kids' homeworks and things like that. So he was always saying you needed to spend more time at home. So when I decided I was going to spend more time at home, my son might have been 11th grade and my daughter was in ninth grade. So I was able to be more present and more active. So I attended parent-teacher conferences. I went with them on their doctor's appointments. My son was running track at that time. So I went to many of his meets. My daughter was a soccer player, an elite soccer player. So I traveled to her different events and I just spent more time with them. In hindsight, you know, I guess I'd have to ask them what they think. They always knew that I loved them and they always knew that I worked hard and provided for them. But I'm sure that they enjoyed that I was more of a traditional mom and they got to see me more. When you talk to younger executives or leaders, and and I know you have a passion for helping women, so specifically women, who feel this pull between home life and career and it and the fake work-life balance concept. Oh, I say fake. Maybe you disagree with that. What advice do you give them based on what you've learned? Well, I agree with you. I don't like the phrase work-life balance. I don't like the phrase because balance sounds like it's scales and they're equal. And I instead use the phrase work-life integration because it's not going to be equal. There are going to be certain times of your life where work's going to take on more prominence and other times that family takes on more prominence. And it's important to give yourself some grace and recognize that you can swing back and forth and that they're not two opposing things. It's one life that's integrated with your work and with your home. So I do try to encourage younger women kind of moving up the corporate ladder that you can have it all, but just not all at once. You know, there's gonna be different points in your career where other things are gonna be more important to you and that's okay. And I guess the other thing that I like to tell them is don't let anybody else define success for you. Everybody's definition of success is different and the definition can change as you grow and you develop. I know in the beginning, I defined success almost exclusively by my title and quite frankly, how much money I made. You know, those to me were the status symbols. And as I got older, I realized that was very short-sighted and I define success nowadays based on, you know, the community, how am I serving the community, From a philanthropy perspective, what am I doing with giving back? I look at, am I growing? You know, what am I doing so that I'm personally growing? What about my health and wellness? You know, am I staying fit? So I just, it's a much more multifaceted approach to defining success. And so I try to have aspiring executives realize that those things are all important. And, you know, you need to focus on them throughout your life and not just think you're going to only do this or only do that. It's that integration that's important. 
And there's a few things there. I mean, I totally agree with you about the, the balance. And I think the interesting thing, the way I think about it is it's really more of a teeter totter. Either you can be all in at home or you can be all in in the community or you can be all in at work, but you can't do any of those well if you're doing them all sort of halfway. And that is such a not most people think the work life balance. But even in the last you know year pandemic, people who have been trying to have their kids be in school while they're trying to work. Nothing is done excellently because you can't we can't do two things at once. Amazing. So therefore, you feel like you're failing at everything. And that just is such a vicious cycle that will just eat you from the inside out. The other thing you said that I think is so important is to be successful, you have to define it. And so you, at all of the stages of your life, have defined what success is and then work to achieve it. And many, many people, whether they're stay-at-home parents or professionally or community member, whatever it is they're doing, if they never define it, they can never achieve it. And to not be able to define and achieve success is a pretty difficult thing for most people. You're absolutely right, Christy. I always say you definitely want to define it because then you'll know when you've achieved it. It's kind of, and yes, I understand sometimes it's a moving target, but it's no different from if you were working and you were bringing out a new product. If you don't define what success looks like upfront, three, four, five years later, the product may be doing well or not doing well, but how are you really going to evaluate it without being emotionally involved? You know what I mean? If you've brought out this new product, even if technically it's not really successful, it's going to be hard to admit that. Whereas on the front end, if you said, we're bringing out this product, we want to have X number of customers that bought it, we want to have X revenue or X profits or whatever it is, right? And then three years later, or every, let's even say one year later, you do a check-in, how are we doing? What are your milestones? Two years, three years. That's a lot easier than if you just say, you don't define it. And three years later, it's like, okay, well, it's making some progress. <laughs> and then you're stuck. So I've always just felt like if you define what is important to you, then you'll be able to achieve it. And you have to measure it. You know, you know that saying, what gets measured gets done. It's all interwoven about making sure that you've got criteria and checkpoints. You talked about something else earlier that I think gets in the way of people achieving success or doing the next thing, whatever that might be, and that's fear. And you were involved in several plane situations and kept getting on airplanes. How did you find the wherewithal to continue to get on an airplane and sit down and be calm without needing to take four Xanax? Maybe you did and you just don't talk about that, but I don't think you did. No, I'm not. I'm not a big drug person unless something's prescribed to me, but I don't usually even ask for it. So I'm a very logical person. And so the next day when I got on the plane, I kept saying to myself, you know, what's the likelihood of me being in a plane crash twice in 24 hours on the same airline, on the same route? You know, so I just kept thinking to myself, it's infinitesimal. So that at least gave me the courage to go on the plane the next day. It's kind of like you fall off a horse, you got to get back on. But subsequently to that, I just kept remembering positive experiences. A little known fact is that I met my husband on an airplane and he wasn't even sitting next to me. He was sitting behind me. And we drew up a conversation and that was around Thanksgiving and the following February, which was Valentine's Day, we got engaged and we just celebrated our 38th wedding anniversary. So to me, even though I've had those horrible experiences with planes, I've been on a plane where there's a fire, I've, you know, I've had all these instances, obviously the, the plane crash. I just remember the positive. I'm optimistic and I remember that I met the love of my life on the airplane. So I look at airplanes as happy experiences. Congratulations. 38 (laughs) years is something to celebrate. And I love that you're thinking about and sharing how you can take any situation and think about negative or think about positive. And that's a choice. And so you sat on that airplane and decided to choose to not think about what happened yesterday, but think about something that happened decades before that fundamentally changed your life in such positive ways. Absolutely, Christy. And it's funny because people always said to me, like, what was I thinking when the plane went down? And I subsequently found out after talking to other passengers that they were texting or they were, you know, fearful and they were concerned that they weren't going to make it. 
And I kept thinking, and maybe it was because I had all these other crazy life experiences, but I kept thinking I always managed to survive. So I was just thinking my son at the time had gotten into my alma mater. My daughter had, had been back playing soccer after a terrible um, injury and she made the US national team. At that time I was married to my husband for about 25 years. So I just kept thinking these positive and happy thoughts. I'm gonna get off this plane. I'm gonna be with my family. Everything's gonna work out. I had no idea how it was gonna work out. But that was kind of my mindset. So you're right. When I was dealing with the adversity, I just focused on the positive and didn't get caught up in the emotion of the negative because you can control certain things. And one of the things you can control is your attitude. And I thought it was best to control my attitude and be positive than spiral into the negative territory. When you get on an airplane now, and perhaps you may even get seated in 5D somewhere, do you think about <laughs> I that? I pick that seat if I can, by the way. I don't mean to interrupt, but I do try to pick that seat if it's available. You I look do. It's my lucky seat. Well, if you're on an airplane with someone that looks like Mary Ambrose, check 5D. <laughs> it potentially is her. And I don't know if it's a good thing to be on an airplane with you or not. I, mean, I don't know if oh, that's... Oh, yes, it is. I tell everybody, I get asked that question a lot. People say to me, or they say, I don't want to travel with you. You're a jinx or blah, blah, blah. And I look at them and I jokingly say, what's your IQ? I said, how many people have you met that have survived a plane crash and all the other things that I've had? You'll have a great experience and you'll live to tell about it. It's an adventure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you feel like you were spared for some higher purpose, for some giving back? Or is that a little bit too deep, I don't deep might not be the right word, but a little bit too, I don't know, making yourself seem special or something when there were 150 other people as well. Have you ever gone there? That's a question that I've grappled with ever since it happened. I, I did try to for a while think about, okay, there has to be a reason. I've had all these experiences and then I, you know, I'm still here. I, I reprioritize my life. What's the higher calling? What's my purpose? Why am I here? And I've never really come up with a good answer other than I just want to make sure that I'm having people that I interact with leave in a better place than when we started the interaction. And just feeling like I can have a positive impact on an individual or a company or something that's important. I like to think of it as um, turning success into significance. You know, how can I do that? How can I use the success that I've had and do something significant? Whether that's impacting a person or impacting a company or impacting a board. Um, that's kind of how I look at it. So I don't know that I have the best answer for that question, but I have thought about it. I've definitely thought about it. It's so interesting how you talked about having just every interaction better. Doesn't mean it has to be a big important thing. It doesn't mean it has to be a small thing, but each of us standing in the grocery store line, getting on an airplane, on a phone call with a friend, whatever it might be, it can be simple. But if you leave that interaction better or make a positive interaction with someone, or they could say that was the best part of their day or whatever it might be, if that's a goal, every interaction is a positive one. That means you have a great day. And if you have a great day, you have a great week. And if you have a great week, you have a great month. And pretty soon you've had a pretty amazing life. Yep. You know, you have to be grateful, you know, and thankful. And as I said, you know, to me, if you want to guarantee a life of meaning, it's that you spend it and live it and share it with others. And that only happens if you have those interactions and you take the time to really listen and be a part of the person you're with conversation and be a part of their life and ask the right questions and help them get to where they want to go, whatever the interaction is. And when we met, we met through a, a nonprofit called C200. I was in the Protégé pro program. This was several years ago. You came in to speak as a member of C200. I know you're quite actively involved. And C200 is one of those groups that you've dedicated time to, to make better interactions, to positively impact, and to leave a legacy of positivity and helping others, and that gratitude piece as well. So for people that don't know, can you talk a little bit about what C200 is and why you're so involved in that organization? Yeah, thanks, Christy. So C200 is an invitation-only organization that helps advance 
women's leadership in business. And so we try to advance, inspire, educate, encourage, celebrate success, shared success. It's a nonprofit and we help women within the membership organization as well as women outside. And so where we're helping women outside, we have several signature programs, one of which was the Protege program, which we work with entrepreneurs to help them grow their business and to help them expand their business. And we provide mentorship and sponsorship to help them do that better. Um, We also have a program called See Ahead, which is the corporate equivalent where we work with um, senior executive women who are maybe one level down from the C-suite and we try to help them achieve that C-suite level. And then we just offered a new program which was called the Champion Program And that program is helping underprivileged women much smaller down, like in their company, small businesses that are maybe producing $250,000 in revenue to maybe a million. And we've given them $25,000 grants to help them with their business. And we've also put them in touch with um, Babson University to help them with leadership and really understand how to grow a successful business. And so those are just some of the programs that we use to give back. And it really all stemmed because many of the C-suite executives, both the corporate executives and the entrepreneur executives, talked about that they hadn't, didn't have any women role models. I know I grew up in the financial services industry. I was president of Evergreen Investment Services, large asset management company, one of the top 20. I was the only female president at the time. And when I left, they replaced me with a white male. And so there were no female executives doing what I had done after I left. And that was not uncommon. And there were a lot of women who had that, regardless of what industry they were in. They talked about how they didn't really have role models. So we wanted to change that. We wanted to be part of the solution. And so that's why this organization was founded. It was founded as a way to help advance inspire, educate, support other women business leaders. Not many people, if you think about it, I don't know what you studied in college, but a lot of young women don't know business, don't aspire to be in business. They don't even know what it is. They might want to be a nurse or they might want to be a teacher or they might want to be an engineer or a doctor, but nobody, you don't really hear women say, oh, I want to be in business. And so that's what we were trying to change. We were trying to help young women realize that business is a great career. And that it's okay to say, I want to not just be in business, but I want to run a business and I want to have a C in front of my name. And I want to do that while having a family. And those are some of the conversations that I so appreciate. Remember specifically when you spoke to my group about how you were so open and vulnerable about both parts of your life. Because so often it's let's talk business, let's talk business, let's talk P&L and what are your KPIs and, you know, dive deep in. And that's important. I, I don't mean that isn't important. It certainly is. And I learned many tools through the C200 program that were really in the weeds of the business. But there's this other element and you are so open about, boy, if I could go back, I would have made some different choices with my family. And I know you don't have regrets, but you did learn some things and shared those with us because all of us, most of us were mothers, our mothers, and we have those thoughts, but I don't know that it's something people want to say out loud. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are some times where I think, and I saw this with my sister. So I have a sister that's a doctor and obviously it's a tough career. And when you go through residency, it's really, really hard. And I know she had said that, you know, as new people came up, they think, oh, we don't want to change the residency program because if I could do it, then they could do it. So it was kind of like, I feel like some women felt like, well, we all had to live with this. And so, you know, everybody knows about it. So let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about the fruits of your labor or talk about, as you said, the P&L, the KPIs, the things that maybe folks didn't understand. And it's only recently that whether it's, you know, all the things that we've experienced, whether it's COVID, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's all these different things in the last two years, that I believe the benefit of all of that is that people have become more transparent, they've become more authentic, you use the word vulnerability, which I think is an important word, and they're willing to share the good, bad, and the ugly. And 
that's why we're human. We're not perfect. We're, we're learning. You know, that's the difference between us and all the other mammals. We learn, we adapt. Um, and that's the beauty of, you know, wisdom and growing and changing because you are learning new things about yourself, about others. I'm quite passionate about women who are in their college years and early stage entrepreneurs. And a lot of the things that I saw modeled by those of you in C200 is to give back and to go back. And and what have I learned that I can help the next generation? And one of the things that fascinates me, and I'm interested in your perspective, when I talk to young women who are in college or maybe early 20s, mid 20s, who are single, might be dating someone, and I, I just do speaking or I, I mentor them, and they'll say to me, how do you balance your family and your career? And they ask me these kinds of in the weeds questions, and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. What I think is interesting is that oftentimes these women, I'll say to them, do you have children? No. Are you married? No. They're thinking about how they're going to balance things before they're even <laughs> real. And men are not men are not doing this. Men are not thinking when they're in college about how they're going to someday be married and have children and where they're going to live. And women do this. And I don't I don't know if that's something you've experienced or what advice you'd have for people who are thinking three steps down the road, which is very different from what you said at the very beginning of this, which is live in the moment, live in the present, enjoy what you have right now. Absolutely correct, Christy. Women think about that and men don't necessarily think about it. And so that's one of the things I tell them. I say, look, the men aren't thinking about this. It'll happen when it happens. So just focus on what you're focused on now. And then when you get to that point in your life, you're going to have someone to talk through it with you. I mean, obviously, if you're going to if you ultimately get married or if you have a partner, they're the ones that you're going to want to talk to about, you know, whatever is important in life. And if you want to have children, you're making those decisions together. So yes, you don't want to get so far ahead because it's just exhausting and it's, you're worrying for nothing. And the reality is you can never predict what your reaction, what your perspective will be until you're in that situation. So even for you, if we would have said to you a week before you got on that airplane, this is going to happen to you, Marianne, what is your reaction going to be? You would have been worried about it and thinking about it. And you have no idea what your reaction is because, well, I mean, you have been in some disasters. <laughs> Most people don't know how they how they would react. But it is it's just such wasted energy. There's all this energy happening going in this negative worrying direction that could be spent on defining success or making the next interaction better or giving back. And that is such a trap that I feel like women in general, based on my experience, are in a little bit more than my I absolutely agree with you. And that's one of the reasons why I said early on that I plan and God laughs. It's one of my favorite things. I mean, you just plan and here they're planning for all these things and the likelihood of it happening the way they're planning is slim and none. And as you said, all they're doing is getting their anxiety level up. I don't see anything good that comes out of it. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't plan. I mean, I do believe in planning. I was always a planner, but you also have to be open to the possibilities when something else happens. And then, you know, is that a door? Is that a new opportunity? And do you want to go through it? And if you're so anxious about other things, you're not going to be able to see that as an opportunity. Well said. If someone Googles you, it's the diva disaster and the seven things, and there's a lot of that out there. Would you like 20, 30, 40 years from now, looking back on your life, to be defined as a woman who gave back, a woman who made everybody better around her, as opposed to the woman who survived seven things? Absolutely. In fact, when I'm asked, there have been times when I've been asked to speak about the plane crash. They're like, oh, just talk about the plane crash. And I, I don't want to do just, I don't want to do that. I mean, I will talk about the plane crash, don't get me wrong, but I usually will turn it into some other type of conversation because I don't want the plane crash to define who I am. You know, the way I want to define myself is that I'm a good mother, I'm a good daughter, I'm a good sister, I'm a good provider, I'm a good friend. I've had run a successful business. I've had a successful career. So these are all the adjectives and the definitions that I want to be known by. And as you said, you know, I want to be known as giving back, as somebody who cared, as somebody who made other people's lives better. So I don't want to be defined just by an event. And, and I've worked really hard to make that not happen. 
you know, so like you said, I mean, you can Google me and you see the event disaster, but you'll also see if YouTube videos where I'm trying to talk about helping aspiring directors become directors. I'll talk about leadership. I will talk about the plane crash. You know, I've done lots of different things, but I, I preface it and I, I put it in the context that it's just, how do you deal with adversity? You know, you're always going to have adversity. And I tell my kids and have told them this forever, that mistakes are marvelous as long as you learn from them. And so you know, you're going to have adversity and that's good because you're going to learn from them. And same thing, we all talk about people are afraid of failure, but failure is good because that means you're stretching yourself. You don't fail. That means you're not really pushing the boundaries. So in thinking about where you are right now and where you're going, do you think the disasters are behind you or are you <laughs> open handed? I can't imagine more disasters happening to you, but you live a pretty adventurous life. So you never know. Does that scare you? No, it doesn't scare me. But there was a time where like when everybody was calling me the diva disaster and the lady with seven lives, you know, and the cat has nine lives. So for the first 50 years of my life, I had used seven up. And I was like, oh, God, if I only have two left, I'm in, you know, I'm really in trouble here because I want to live. I don't necessarily want to live to 100 unless I have my health and wellness. But I at least want to live to 80 or 85, right? So I'm thinking, wow, I got 35 more years. I only have two more lives left. <laughs> so in the beginning, I got a little nervous. But now I don't. I don't. Because if you're living in the moment and you're spending your life with the people you care about, right? Your family, your friends, your faith, God forbid something really did happen to me and I perished. I'm okay with that because I know that the last few years I reoriented myself to what was important to me. So, you know, I don't, I don't think of, I'm going to have another issue. Just doesn't cross my mind. And I don't want to pin you into the only the the miracle on the Hudson. However, I know that people listening are saying, Christy, ask her, did she like the movie? Did you like the movie? <laughs> I've seen it. I know you have a, a spot at the very end when they, we all know how it ends. You all live. But at the end, they talk about the real people. Right. So did you like it? Did you think they did a good job? I thought the movie was excellent. I thought Tom Hanks did a terrific job. And it was really realistic. A lot of people don't realize it. In fact, some people were like, oh my God, I can't believe they were grilling Sully so much. And, you know, so there was a little bit of drama and exaggeration, but if you think about it, I mean, there are always government regulations. Whenever there's a plane crash, they have to check are the pilots, were they drinking? Were they, you know, from a liability and insurance perspective, all that has to happen. And so, you know, it's not always black and white. But I thought they did a fabulous job of capturing Sully's experience. And um, that is why we were successful. I mean, here was an individual who was set up to do this because he had been a glider pilot. He had been a military pilot. He had been a commercial pilot. He had all this experience. And that's what led him to make that difficult decision in less than three minutes to go to the Hudson. And when you ask him, which I did, you know, how did he do that? Because everybody was questioning him and that part of the movie was so true. He had said that his military training prepared him because you're taught to, you know, expect the best but prepare for the worst. And so in his mind, he knew that if he went to the airport and missed the runway, that he would kill thousands of people. There would be thousands of casualties because both at LaGuardia or even Teterboro, it's surrounded by huge apartment complexes. Whereas if he went in the water and he was unsuccessful, it would be 155 casualties. So in less than you know three minutes, he had the presence of mind to use that training to make that decision. And in the end, obviously it worked out for all of us. But that was another example of me realizing that practice makes perfect. You know, the, the more you do stuff, it becomes rote and you just act in the moment based on your years of experience. And that's what he did. So I thought the movie did a fabulous job of explaining that. Um, and I felt that it did a really good job of encouraging hope and making people realize that things could turn out differently. And as I said, one of my favorite sayings was when he said, it's only impossible until it's possible. 
That's one of the incredible things about people like you sharing your story, sharing what you learned, talking openly about it, because you are able to share that experience and make the next person's life better. And had Sully not had all of those experiences, and he had he not been able to put that to work, who knows what would have happened on that airplane. And I'm sure you've thought about that many times. So thank goodness he was an experienced pilot behind the wheel who could keep from, frankly, freaking out and making a really devastating decision. And there's a lot of parallel, honestly, in what you're doing now in this stage of your life in taking what you've learned, putting it into practice, and helping other people and making their lives better. So as someone who has been on the receiving end of hearing you talk and having dinner with you, I want to thank you because I know I'm one of many. And you have been an inspiration in that we all have an obligation to, I believe, we all have an obligation to take what we've learned, to use it, and to give it back to someone else to make their life better. And if we all did that, we'd be living in a different world. Yes, we would. A much better one. True. To end this, uh, I want to do it the way that we end all the podcasts, which is do you have a lyric or a quote or something that has motivated you as you have flipped your script? I don't have a lyric, although I jokingly thought to myself, I will survive would be good <laughs> by Donna Summer. But when I looked at the lyrics, I was like, yeah, no, that's kind of like divorce and so they're not related to me at all. So I decided that would work. But I guess I would just say, and it goes back to dealing with adversity. I like to say tough times won't last, but tough people will. So, you know, good, bad things happen to good people. And so you just have to recognize that eventually it too shall pass and you'll get over it. And so I would say those are the things that I focused on most, which is all of us are going to deal with adversity. It's just having the, the will and the belief that you can overcome it. Thank you for sharing your story. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Christy. So many things we can take from Mary Ann's story and from have a positive attitude. Everyone that you meet, you have an opportunity and perhaps an obligation to make their day better and to have a, a positive, uplifting interaction. Share your experiences with others. Get over your fear. Now, that's easier said than done, I realize, but... Getting over fear will make an impact on your life and the lives of others. Define success. What is it for you? And it's going to change. Seasons of life means success looks different. And have perspective. Think about your perspective and make the world a better place. My hope is Marianne's story empowers you to believe you're capable of more than you think, to discover motivation, to uncover inspiration, and to find the strength to turn the page. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Script, hosted by Christy Peel and produced by Media Minefield. If you like our message, please be sure to give us a five-star rating and subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also check out flipyourscriptpodcast.com for pictures, resources mentioned in the show, and information about our other great episodes. 